The white laboratory rat is perhaps the most well-known and iconic organism used in biology. The rat in this context functions as a miniature stand-in for a human being. Lab rats are modified by selective breeding or genetic engineering to present diseases and behaviors that more commonly afflict people. This particular rat was bred by Finland's National Public Health Institute to embody one of their nation's most prevalent public health concerns, alcoholism. The rat is a descendant of a population of rats developed at the Worcester Institute in Philadelphia in 1906 that were arguably the first line of inbred animals still used in research today. From this population, the alcoholic rats were selectively bred over many generations by breeding only the rats that preferred alcohol over water when given a choice between the two. In Finland, they were used in the development of the Sinclair method for the treatment of addiction that attempts to chemically reprogram the pleasure response of the brain. During the early 2000s, the research project was cancelled, and the status of the alcoholic rat population in Finland remains unknown. My name is Rich Pell, and I'm here representing uh, this, this organization called the Center for Post-Natural History, of which I'm, you could say, founder and director and like janitor. Um, but I'm not the only person involved in the center. Uh, I, there's, I would also have to give credit to our, our lead scientific advisor, Lauren Allen, who's back in Pittsburgh. Uh, and here in our audience uh, is Mason Jude, who's, who's responsible for the structure uh, you see upstairs, which is amazing. So thank you, Mason. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna go through kind of this basic idea of, of of what I think is post-natural, and, and maybe that'll help fuel a conversation that we can carry on, because uh, I, th I think there's some, some competing, really interesting competing words to describe this, this whatever it is, this next nature, this uh, supernature I heard. What's the other one? Second, Second nature. And, uh, and I'm here to talk about the post-nature, so. Um, this all started to come about um, maybe six or seven years ago, I was hanging out in a lot of natural history museums, the same time that I was learning about this new kind of emerging form of genetic engineering uh, called synthetic biology uh, at the time. Uh, and I just became aware that there were these kind of gaps in the collection of the museum. There are things that weren't there. There are things that I was interested in, living organisms, uh, that were not present in the natural history museum. Um, this place that kind of by its own design is there to uh, to try to tell a complete story of like, you know, bring into one place the global diversity of life on, on planet Earth. Um, but there's this stuff they were leaving out. Um, and it tended to be things that had a kind of a cultural imprint on them. Things that had been intentionally shaped by people. This is a very popular hobby in parts of the United States. Um, but it's true, kind of plays out all over the world. We do this with animals, this the Belgian blue. Um, but uh, it seemed the more that these things had been changed by people, the less likely they were to be represented in a natural history collection. That this wasn't just an oversight, this was a, an intentional omission. Um, and it seemed like a blind spot, and a blind spot that seemed worth filling. Uh, and that essentially is where the idea for having a museum uh, called the Center for Post-Natural History comes from. Um, it, it started with a collection in the beginning, and this kind of grappling around for a word. It took a long time to arrive at the word post-natural. Uh, but the basic concept behind it uh, is that these are living things that have been intentionally shaped by people uh, and that it, it's, it's heritable, that it's, it affects the offspring. Um, so it has kind of evolutionary consequence. So like, like topiary gardening, if you clip your bushes into the shape of Mickey Mouse, it's not really post-natural. Uh, but if you can trick them into breeding so that they make little tiny Mickey Mouse plants, then that might be uh, qualify, and especially if you're doing it on purpose. Uh, it doesn't count if it's um, uh, insects that are mutated as a result of the Fukushima disaster, which is clearly a, a cultural, uh, culturally created ecological disaster, um, but uh, I would argue is not on purpose. Um, so in the beginning, it was just a, a collection, trying to amass um, documents of these living things, uh, the actual physical bodies, which turns out, and maybe I, I was naive in the beginning, this is very different from collecting photographs of things. Um, the living body doesn't 
it, it, it wants to decay. It wants to be food. Uh, it wants to either be alive and eat and shit, or it wants to become food. And, and the practice of natural history collections is to like remove them from that economy. We'll get more to that later. It's tricky business. Uh, but we would also make um, exhibits that uh, would will document the context that these organisms are in. They're kind of their habitat. Um, these organisms that we're changing, uh, we're necessarily raising them in captivity. Uh, and that, that ecology is part of what changes their shape. Uh, so these are, you know, genetically modified fish that you buy in pet stores in the U.S., which are illegal here, if any of you have them, um, but uh, are all raised in the U.S. by a single fish farm in Florida. Uh, I always kind of imagine if you were to shine a big uh, ultraviolet lamp over these, these little fish ponds, they would kind of glow in different rainbow colors. Um, and we build exhibits that uh, even use the old-fashioned style telephones. If you go upstairs, this is what you'll see. Um, this is an earlier version of it. Uh, and in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, we now, as of March of this year, have a, have a permanent museum. It's open three days a week um, where specimens from the collection are discussed and contextualized. Uh, occasionally other artists come in. We run workshops. We do experiments. Um, that was us trying to grow genetically modified corn in our front window. Uh, we use taxidermy. We use all the, the kind of the tropes uh, and techniques of natural history collections in order to try to document um, this, this landscape of living things that have been altered by us. This is a kind of a recent acqu acquisition. Uh, this is what you see on the poster, and it's what you'll see upstairs. And there's, the poster is deceiving. You expect it to maybe be like on a dinosaur scale. And this is vanishingly small. Um, this is a mouse embryo. Uh, and it's, it's kind of representative of what is actually pretty unusual, which is a gene genetically modified organism that looks very different from um, its non-genetically engineered cousins. Uh, what's amazing about this is not the fact that it's purple and blue. That was like a technique so that you can see the bones, but it's, it's very cool looking. Um, but these are two different genetically modified mice. Uh, the one on the left um, has one particular gene turned off, and it's a gene that's apparently uh, responsible for the formation of ribs. He has no ribs. Probably wouldn't get very far in life. Um, he was, both of these were, were, were killed before they would have been born. Um, the one on the right has the same gene turned all the way up, or we would say 211, uh, and it has ribs that grow all the way down its spine. It has way too many. But that's kind of the exception. Most of the time, these are really indistinguishable from uh, the familiar non-engineered versions. Um, but then we can look at organisms that we've been breeding for a long time uh, that we maybe take for granted. Chickens, I think, are a fantastic example of this. We think of them as being sort of natural. Uh, you're not going to find anything in the wild that looks exactly like that. That's a sculpture. It took a very long time to, to arrive at. Um, but those are aesthetic choices. It's kind of a relationship between animal and person and culture. Um, and cultures all over the world have been breeding chickens in very peculiar ways for thousands of years. Um, and and this is not done with the, the kind of genetic engineering that we talk about. This is done in the, the, the old, slow version of selective breeding domestication. Um, likewise, these are all reflections of the culture that, that creates them. Uh, so one of the most common forms of chickens now are the, the sorts of chickens we use in uh, uh, factories and like in the home state of Delaware where I'm from, big chicken industry. Very important that these chickens be identical. That's the most important thing about them. Uh, that they, the machines can process them as just parts. Uh, this is also a reflection of, of a cultural impulse. Um, another branch to this is, is the contributions of, of hobbyists, of non-utilitarian breeders to increasing the diversity of the, uh, the post-natural world. Um, pretty much any organism that's been bred in captivity for any length of time that, that's domesticated uh, there's kind of a subset of those breeders who breed for um, non-utilitarian purposes. Uh, they're, they're not there for farm animals. They're not there to make food. They're not there to 
I guess maybe they are there to entertain, um, but they find traits that are not beneficial to the organism, that are specifically maybe even detrimental to the organism, um, and they reinforce them for reasons of uh, perhaps entertainment. Maybe, that's, maybe that is the right word. Um, these are, are pigeons that kind of uncontrollably, what they call roll, tumble. Um, these ones have been so bred uh, that they're unable to fly. So there's a, there's a common uh, form of these called uh, Birmingham rollers, and they kind of do these backflips in the air, and, and, and people think that's really beautiful who raised them. Kind of whole flocks of these birds that all, it seems to be contagious. They kind of all at once will start to tumble, and then they'll catch themselves, and they'll keep flying, and hopefully they catch themselves before they uh, hit the ground. Um, but then within that community are people who have bred them to the point where they can no longer even fly. Uh, and um, I'm not gonna show you this whole video because it's kind of upsetting even to me. Um, but there is a sport, at least in the US, uh, of rolling for distance. These are called parlor rollers. And uh, <laughs> sucked all the air out of the room. Um, they go quite a long ways. Um, okay, so one of the concepts that I think is really useful in, in when looking at a post-natural organism to try to like tease out you know, what, it, what it all means, what does it connect to beyond just kind of looking at it as an object. Um, this is what I call points of origin. Um, it's basically what is the, the ancestry or even the, the common ancestor of uh, a living thing that's been, been bred by us. Uh, so, you know, if we think about, you know, Darwin, Darwinian evolution, um, if we were to grab any two living things in the world uh, and we were to compare their family trees way back, way, way, way back, way, 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 way back, uh, eventually we, we have somebody in common. Uh, this, you know, between us and fruit flies or, uh, you know, city rats and uh, any other living thing, uh, there's kind of a common ancestry. The tree eventually converges. Uh, what's interesting about post-natural organisms is that that convergence always, let's say by definition, uh, converges in a place where there's people, a, a cultural place, a, a laboratory, a farm, uh, somewhere somebody was breeding this organism that later on had all this diversity and was shared all over the world. Um, but the common ancestry brings us back to a particular place, not, not an abstract one. So here's an example. Uh, these are cells uh, that I got to photograph under a scanning microscope. These are HeLa cells. They're human, human cells, um, but they're also cancerous. Um, and these are used all over the world uh, as a kind of stand-in for humans. This is like a very common uh, reason for making a post-natural organism, is to have a little representative of people because we don't like to mess with people anymore. That was popular for a while, uh, and right now it's very politically uh, taboo and ethically and morally taboo. So we farm that work out to uh, tissue cultures and to small mammals, mice, rats. Um, so these cells are used all over the world to study the effects of radiation, occasionally pharmaceuticals, this kind of thing. If we take their ancestry, uh, they all converge on this, this one woman, Henrietta Lacks. So that's the Gila that, that makes up her name. Um, this story's gotten a lot of attention in recent years, uh, in good part because of the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which I have to plug, because it does a fantastic job of describing what I think of as a post-natural history of, a, of, a, of an organism. Henrietta Lacks had a tumor. A piece of that tumor was taken by a, a doctor who was also studying how to keep little pieces of people, tissue, alive outside of the body. And her cells were the first to successfully um, do that. And he shared those cells because they were able to do that. And so those cells were shared between scientists all over the world uh, and are now, she, she died within a year of that piece of her body being taken off, but her cells are still alive and you can mail order them and you can walk into just about any substantial uh, university in the world that has a biotech facility and, and there will be parts of Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks' body still uh, in a dish. Um, you could do the same thing by looking at like the most iconic laboratory organism, the, the lab rat. This is the, the, the first uh, of the mammals to be inbred to the point where 
the, the children were basically the same as the adults. Um, it's a very important for, for researchers to know that we're all using the same thing. Uh, so they kind of can be treated as a part. And what I do to my rat, you should be able to do to your rat and have the same outcome. That's the goal. Uh, these rats, their history, really interesting. So they converge in like 1906 in Philadelphia with uh, the, the, the breeding uh, of, of rats in the laboratory environment. But before that, they were kind of popularly bred as white rats in sort of a hobby fashion. We called them fancy rats, and people would breed different coat colors. We do this with gerbils still, probably more than we do with rats. Um, but that was, that was the hobby that kind of set the genetic stage for them to be used in the lab. But w where were they before that? Why would anybody take a sewer rat and start to breed it for fun? It doesn't make sense, because they didn't. Because before that, there was a hobby called rat baiting. Uh, and this is where you'd get a whole bunch of sewer rats together, about 100 of them, exactly 100. This is the key unit. And then you would bet money on how long it would take a dog to kill them all. And this is really popular in London and New York, two major cities that have phenomenal rat problems. Uh, and this is kind of early 19th century. Um, the sport was successful enough that at a certain point it became uh, really difficult to catch enough rats to keep it going every night. So people started to breed rats in captivity for the first time on purpose. Uh, and eventually, you know, these little white, white, a white one would appear, which is totally weird and funny, an albino, albino rat. Well, let's, let's put him in his own bucket. Uh, and before long, we've got this little population of these funny white rats. And they're, they're kind of divorced from the disgustingness of the sewer rats and they can find this new audience, a new habitat in people's homes, in little cages. They're kind, of, they're kind of cute. They're not like those disgusting rats. Um, so at every step, this ancestry takes us back to kind of a human cultural story. Uh, here's just a picture of a couple of white lab rats that were uh, in the collection of the Smithsonian. Um, they only had a, had a few, and they're, they're filed under, as you can see, under locality unknown, just kind of like miscellaneous, weird, we don't know what this is. Um, uh, let's see. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 the act of keeping these bodies in a collection. Um, I think we're, we're, going to, we're going to talk a little bit about the DIY, the do-it-yourself kind of aspects of, of this kind of work. Um, and I'm not a trained uh, scientist of any kind. Um, and certainly not when it comes to like preserving living things. So one of the first specimens in the collection are uh, these genetically modified mosquitoes, um, which I, I contacted a lab and I talk a pretty good story, I guess. They welcomed me in uh, and I was given a, a cart with full of little ice cream containers, each containing a different variety of mosquito, genetically engineered mosquito, and they're alive. Uh, and then they gave me um, a tank of carbon dioxide and a bucket of ice. And they said, do you need anything else? And I, I, didn't, I, I had no idea what these things were for. Um, apparently, the, the ice slows them down enough that you can use the CO2 to, to kind of knock them out. Uh, and at, at that point, all I could remember was, uh, you go to the museum, they're all in little pins. So I asked them if they had any pins, um, which they gave me some. They, they, thankfully, they had some on hand. And I've spent the rest of the day really carefully trying to impale these, these mosquitoes on pins, um, which it, it turns out nobody does. That's not, you don't do, the mosquitoes are too tiny and fragile. You're supposed to cut a little sliver of paper and glue them with the tiniest drop of glue, and then you pin the paper. Um, so I, already I was off to a great start. Um, and then I was preparing for a talk just like a few months later. Uh, and I open my precious collection of mosquitoes, and the pins are there, and my labels are there, but the mosquitoes are gone. Uh, mo almost all of them. I, I had three left. And I went, shit. Um, well, at the bottom of each pin, there are these tiny little specks of shit, of something, some kind of bug excrement. Uh, presumably not the mosquitoes, which were dead. Uh, on the inside of the lid, I found this guy, and he's really tiny. Um, and I put him under my microscope and photographed him and posted it to Facebook, because I was angry. 
<laughs> I said, does anybody recognize this? Um, and our scientific advisor, Lauren Allen, actually immediately did recognize it as a dermestid beetle larvae. And I went, oh, right, that's what everyone at the Smithsonian was constantly on the lookout for, uh, that these are the bugs that eat their collections. They're also the bugs that clean the flesh off the bones for their collections. So there's this wonderful love-hate relationship with the dermestid beetles. Um, turns out he wasn't dead, uh, and so he kind of became this pet around the museum. We named him Ringo. Um, and uh, even had a lot of dreams about him. He was bigger in the dreams. Uh, but eventually we gave him a catalog number when he did die and added him to the collection as sort of an honorary member. He's not really post-natural, but his entire diet, his whole life, was genetically modified mosquitoes, so that's got to count for something. Um, lastly, I think we should wrap it up and then we'll move to the next one. Okay, yeah, lastly, uh, this uh, uh, taxidermied silky chicken um, is, is I, I, I pr very proudly featured in our Pittsburgh Museum. Uh, it's a bizarre uh, variety of chicken where the feathers kind of become unfrayed so it looks like fur uh, and it's you know, bright white and their skin is blue and their bones are black and just so, so many weird traits in one, one animal. Um, but I'd never killed a chicken in my life before and it proved to be way harder uh, than I had expected. Um, and there were tears involved and phone calls for other people to come and help. Um, you, you'd think you'd just slit the throat, and that's a good way to do it unless the, the bird is all white and you don't want to mess it up. Um, I tell you these stories <laughs> just to make it clear how unexpert I am uh, and, and that, that that's not a bar to entry <laughs> with this kind of stuff. It's all stuff you kind of learn as you go. Um, so we'll pause there, I guess, and uh, maybe we can, who's next? Do you want to introduce the next person? We're better at it. Okay, good. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I wanted to start, start off with a, a question you more or less introduce yourself, uh, um, Rich. The, the difference between post and next and second. Uh, Gianna Maria Gatti states in her uh, book, The Technological Herbarium, that uh, uh, it is through art, the paintings of Lascaux, that uh, humans have separated themselves from nature, of which they're so much part. So, uh, um, and she calls that second nature. Mm. Um, I, we heard about um, super nature uh, because Naturalis uh, is going to set up an event around that. We don't know what it means, but uh, um, with uh, uh, second nature in the back of your head, what, what then still is the meaning of post nature? And after your answer, I would like to ask Kurt, what then is the, the meaning of a next right. nature? Um, well, let's see, post natural, I mean, I. I spent a couple of years trying to figure out a word to describe this stuff. Uh, previous candidates included transgeneography, uh, it, it, a lot of words that required a lot of explanation. Um, Post-natural, for all of its internal contradictions, is at least partially self-explanatory. Uh, and it's also one word, uh, the way I spell it. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of a playoff of postmodernism. Um, and, and that kind of can fit it into some sort of cultural landscape and people hear it sometimes say, oh, that sounds kind of arty. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't really my intention, but I see why you say that. Um, but it doesn't imply uh, like a, a line that this is a new epoch. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to, 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 to say that, um, but it does acknowledge that this kind of feedback loop that an organism changing the other organisms around it. Um, everybody, ev every living thing does that, uh, but to the extent that we're conscious, uh, we're doing it on purpose and we're doing it across a larger swath of the evolutionary tree. Um, you know, there are ants that kind of farm aphids and they kind of keep them as food and they're, uh, that's, that's kind of one example, but we do this across the board. Um, and that's worthy of acknowledging in some fashion. So the word post-natural was 
in some respects, and I hope this isn't disappointing, but it was convenient because it hadn't been defined and it was a word and it was kind of hiding in plain sight. So it's something that people had sort of kicked around here and there, but um, nobody had really tied a definition to it, so I grabbed it. I, I, I really wonder what it means, post-natural. It may be useful in the beginning of such a project, but um, um, we are primates, excessively intelligent primates, so we're, we are part of nature. You, you could argue that, that our whole culture is interwoven with, with nature, so I always wonder how um, realistic the dichotomy between culture and nature is. It, 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 that distinction has always been, been made, but, yeah. but should it be pursued? I, I, would, I definitely do not want to emphasize the, uh, the dichotomy. Uh, in some respects, it comes from the, nature, the definition of nature that's used by natural history museums. Uh, so they'll, they'll always say, well, everything's nature. They always want to put a bigger box over everything. But in practice, they're not. In practice, they're not interested in these kinds of organisms. They are uh, alternately bored by them or feel that their resources aren't sufficient to explore this new territory. Uh, there's any number of excuses I've encountered. Um, but for the most part, uh, and you're, certainly the naturalis here is actually an exception. Um, for the most part, it's entirely ignored. Uh, so, by taking their working definition of nature, as, an, as exists in practice in a natural history museum, then we can create the concept of post-natural, um, just in response to it. So, in some sense, it's reactive. My sense to uh, the word post-natural is also that, and I think that's where we are moving away from, is that there was once this thing called nature, and that this was a static thing, and it was out there, and it was, it was just there, and then people came. And yeah. we started spoiling everything, and uh, spoiling the environment, uh, altering organisms. And there's also uh, a moral part in that, that it's not a good thing. I think it also stems from this Christ Christian view that people are kicked out of the paradise, and since that moment we can only do, uh, do wrong. In, in nature, so and the, there's this beautiful, harmonic, balanced, natural world, mm. and then people came. Yeah. And I think that's a very false image, um, because of course, I think most people here in the audience uh, know about evolution theory. It's 150 years old, that's really not that old. It's really, it's, it's still taking some time to completely arrive and land in our culture, I think. Yeah. Um, but evolution theory make, make, makes you realize that uh, nature changes, it evolves, and evolution goes on. And the only thing now is that we, as uh, people, realize that we play a factor here. We, uh, we are catalysts in this evolutionary process, you could say. But it's still, in the end, uh, it's still nature, I, I would say. It's part of nature. I think in the whole origin of species, the, the word evolution is not even mentioned. It, at, at that time it was called descent by modification. And many of the organisms uh, in your exhibition uh, have a, a, one or more genes that have been changed on purpose. But you, 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 you could say that they are examples of descent by modification. I even wondered I found it a very interesting exhibition and find it a, a, an exciting subject, but I wondered why not exhibit the um, ancestral species uh, besides the descended species or the, the modified one? Is, is that a de deliberate choice? or why? Be Because that demonstrates what, what, what human beings actually are doing. They are... Certainly, I could, I could exhibit photographs. One of the things I was able to do it when I was uh, at the Smithsonian was to go through and document the ancestral species um, because they would have you know, a, a white mouse from 100 years ago. I, I can't just get that now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that is, that is a part of, part, of, part of what we want to do is to connect to uh, that, that history of the past, that it's, it, it is unbroken. Um, and that we are, when we modify any living thing, we are, we are build, building upon a process that's been going on for 
billions of years. You know? no. I wonder, do you also feel you are you promoting that we should do this? No, because a lot of people are against it. Uh, yeah, no, we're, we're we're documenting. Okay, yeah. Uh, yesterday we had another discussion in the Hortus uh, Botanicus in Leiden and uh, we were talking about the strange co-occurrence of um, the, the loss of biodiversity on the other hand by humans and the creation of new biodiversity uh, when, when you look at uh, uh, what we are able to genetically modify etc. Um, Thijs, you've been studying um, the uh, cichlids in uh, Uganda, in Lake Victoria, uh, but you've been also uh, looking at uh, the, the loss of that um, mm -hmm. variety and that... Um, um, I work for a group of um, biologists uh, from Leiden, together with uh, Tanzanian biologists. Yeah. And we studied the so-called adaptive radiation of cichlid fishes in the lake. The lake is more or less an isolated world um, and could be considered as a, an, an island uh, with even islands, archipelagos within the lake, stony islands uh, to which the, these fishes are attached. They are bad travelers. And island archipelagos often are inducive to the origin of new spe species to speciation, so they are ideal fishes to or organisms to study uh, uh, the origin of new species, and they show uh, explosive speciation, really in a pace that is unrivaled by uh, vertebrate animals. You see uh, new species uh, um, originating all the time. And probably more than 500 species in less than 14,000 years. So that's for uh, speciation very rapidly. Yeah. And while we were do doing the research, uh, a huge predator entered the research area and exterminated uh, uh, most of uh, the fishes that we had just given names, just like you give names to your <laughs> modified specimens. It, it gives you the idea that you start to understand something and you give a name and it's a kind of appropriation and then you start understanding some something of that organism and getting a relationship and study the, the basic ecology. Yeah. Well, but, but I never found in your writings that you are uh, pessimistic about the introduction of this uh, predator. Oh. Well, my, maybe, I've, I've maybe been I depressed for years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but are you also depressed uh, uh, by the fact that uh, uh, humans are able to create so many more uh, other species? Uh, uh, this goes very fast. I, w I was depressed uh, not only because it's uh, one of the not so many examples of uh, a great biodiversity uh, in a small area, but I see what happened there as a, uh, an example of what hap happens everywhere in the world uh, the, by, by, by transporting new species to areas where they couldn't come without the help of human beings. So the, the, the impact of exotic species, especially on islands and island archipelagos or lakes, which are a kind of inverted islands, can be... Uh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you at least metaphorically see a uh, similarity between what you describe as uh, species radiation uh, mm. in Lake Tanzania and uh, species radiation in uh, GMOs made by uh, humans? Mm. Well, I have to think about that, but my first response would be that you could see the laboratories as a kind of islands in which uh, new variants of a certain species are created. And uh, they have been genetically or are being genetically modified there. And um, you could call that the, the start of a new species or a new form or whatever. <coughs> so there is a certain parallel and uh, these, these, these labs are in constant 
contact with each other maybe, but some might be more or less isolated from others and then uh, the parallel goes even further. And, uh, in the most isolated labs I would expect that the new forms <laughs> Uh, arise most easily. That could be a parallel. Yeah, but is it, and, and uh, uh, maybe it's interesting to inform our audience about that. Isn't it also that uh, a lot of uh, the um, technology used to make GMOs has similarities in the sense that a biological, uh, or a, a bacterial or a viral factor is used to um, alter genetic information in that organism? Yeah, we're, uh, many of the tools of genetic engineering are ones that we've just borrowed from nature. Um, so a, a virus that already effect, infects an organism, like a, a retrovirus that kind of infects and adds its DNA to that, the DNA of that organism becomes a, a kind of a tool, a kind of a screwdriver or guided missile or they, there's all sorts of metaphors that people use to describe this stuff but you know we don't invent it out of whole cloth we hijack something that's already in play and then just kind of modify it and change the package um, but yeah that's that's kind of one of the reasons that there is this um, uh, commonality between genetic engineering and how nature changes itself um, when we get right down to it, human intention is kind of the biggest difference. Um, but much of the time when we're, we're using bacteria and viruses, they're the same things that already change life in nature. We just start doing it on purpose. Of course, you are maintaining, not only by yourself, but also with a lot of other mm -hmm. contributors, uh, uh, a blog that is well read over the world. Um, Thijs, um, you're an essayist, um, uh, talking about um, also art science interactions. Uh, I'm writing in literary journals that not, are not read at all. Uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the hits, although uh, that was a nice yeah. article, yeah. <laughs> and, and Rich, you are uh, building up uh, a collection uh, that will grow and grow, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, the three of you uh, say something about that strategy. You are making art, Rich. Um, you're maintaining a blog, uh, Thijs is, uh, um, has said goodbye to science and is an essayist, or am I mm -hmm. not right? Well, I'm still following uh, the, the, the main yeah. developments in evolutionary biology and ecology, and yeah. I try to write about these things, but in a rather personal way, yeah. not as a science writer. Yeah. So I, I allow myself irresponsible uh, fragments or ideas or I'm, I'm not somebody like Richard Dawkins who has a broad overview over the literature and reports about research by others and himself and then tells before he starts writing a book he knows exactly what, what schedule he'll, he'll follow and where what the story is that he wants to tell and for me, uh, it's more exciting not to know that. And uh, while writing, uh, asking myself questions and uh, maybe, maybe encounter something that is surprising for myself and hopefully for some readers. Yeah. So that's a more literary ap approach with a biological view. Yeah. Uh, can we also see that in, uh, in, in Rich's approach, because you, you, you say nothing uh, uh, that is right or wrong about uh, how you collect and how you uh, construct your stories. You don't take a standpoint uh, towards the, the ethical justness of GMOs. It's, it's hard to do. Uh, I mean, we, we really make a concerted effort to try not to use language that's kind of already in play and that's already coded with some you know, presumption that you're supposed to have about what it, what it all means. We, we try to avoid academic language, activist language, and uh, language of the industry. Um, we can't always do that, but we try to. Uh, we ultimately want people to walk away with their own conclusion, something that they can really take ownership. It's not about whether or not they agree with me. It's, it's something that they've discovered on their own. Um, and that's another reason why we went ahead with building a physical place, um, is that I felt like that 
uh, kind of experience takes more time. You know, I wanted people to spend 20 or 30 minutes. It's not something that happens um, on the internet too often. Um, you know, the, 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 the cost of that is that it takes us a long time to build new exhibits. We can't be super responsive to what's going on in the news. Um, but I'm a slow writer anyway, so it, it, it fits my times, uh, time better. I'm, I'm a terrible bloggist. Yeah, Kurt, same question to you. Uh, yeah, I started uh, with the blog, I think, six, seven years ago, because it was just an easy way to uh, share this different kind of observation about how do we look at nature and is this changing? So it was just the appropriate way to reach people and that's how it started. Very much as more as a notebook for yourself, as a research tool for yourself to just uh, think aloud. Um, but then uh, after some years, uh, actually a lot of people started visiting the website. So then it sh shifted towards more becoming this uh, channel of publicizing things. And in the end, we also decided to make a big book uh, mm -hmm. from the website because blog is just it's just one big stream of um, observations and to categorize it is quite uh, another thing so that's well, why we moved to a, bo a book um, in the end for me the most important thing is that uh, I think we are now living in a time in which we are radically rethinking our notion of nature and how we as people relate to nature our position towards nature and I think it will take 50 years to, to have the full effect on, uh, on society. And right now we are in the awareness phase. So we are now in the phase where we think, oh wait, maybe uh, we should look different at our relationship and our position in nature. Um, and also these kind of um, exhibits are very rewarding in that uh, sense because it's, it's tangible and you see, okay, we people, are, we are doing this. Um, and whereas I think 10 years ago, uh, we were still in a situation in which a large amount of people in society were just against it. Just, they said like, don't do it. And now it's already different. Um, so it's, it's shifting because we realize that we just have this enormous impact. We domesticated the dog 15,000 years ago and uh, today we do other stuff with more precision but it's also what we do as people. And uh, I think that realization and that understanding is, uh, is quite new. And we still need a lot of time um, to move from the question, should you do it or shouldn't you do it, to the much more important question, how do we do it? What is our model? When do we do it? When do we restrain? How do we operate? And that question, uh, uh, I think, is being answered now in this uh, period. We have to find a mode for that. I think it's a good idea to uh, make a distinction between a moral or ethical discussion and a biological discussion mm -hmm. and therefore I think it's a good idea to make such an exhibition in a non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. But I think a new ethics is required and Certainly. it yeah. is very important. Yeah. Do you know what it will how it will operate? Do you have a feeling for that or an expectation? Or? Well, only more or less intuitively that some things that uh, I think are uh, useful to, to cure people, to, yeah. to get rid of diseases, yeah. to uh, avoid suffering of uh, people. But uh, once you hear from uh, experiments with monkeys that uh, get some bioilluminescent gene uh, uh, and therefore have um, a green lightning faces. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's very doubtful, I think, at least uh, I, I would like to discuss about things mm -hmm. like that, uh, whether that's desirable. and For aesthetical uh, reasons. Yes, well, uh, uh, it must, must, uh, maybe even for these fishes, it's, it's no fun to be uh, completely yellow and uh, lose your complete species recognition system, uh, probably without being aware of that, but uh, the whole life of the fish may change while uh, human beings are just changing them 
for entertaining reasons. This is also valid for some of the dogs we have at pe as pets that they of can course. hardly breed or yeah. but they're uh, really I, handicapped I, animals, I, I, naturally I, born I, I animals. I often have objections yes. to the yeah. artificial selection mm -hmm. of dogs that uh, go so far that their, their eyes are bulging out of their... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, you, you have a, a group of students around you at the uh, university, the Technical University of Eindhoven, where you uh, uh, work around designing for Next Nature. Mm -hmm. Do you also discuss those ethical um, complexities uh, when you give assignments to design yeah, for certain... Yeah, I think that's the point. Yes, definitely. Uh, there's one thing I need to say about this department we have in Eindhoven, because... Um, we are now talking about changing organisms and that, we, that nature is evolving through that, but there's something else that should be in the mix, which is technology, because nowadays technology has also become an evolutionary factor. Um, and so we're co-evolving. Uh, technology is evolving, people are evolving, these organisms are evolving. Mm -hmm. So you should get all that together. And uh, in Eindhoven, we focus a little bit more on the technological part, uh, uh, so it's, the scope is, is different, um, but the ethical question and the societal questions, uh, I think they are really in, at the forefront of what we do. It's yeah. really important. Yeah, the exhibition of Rich is part of the Studio Lab project of Vax Society, uh, which is a combination of uh, looking for uh, an ethical perspective in uh, uh, life sciences and uh, uh, try to um, have arts and sciences interact to also investigate that perspective. And more in general, Bach Society uh, um, um, fosters a, a big maker's culture. Um, we have a fat lab next, next doors, um, which is not so much represented in um, the collection you show here, Rich, but you have a background uh, as another director, the director of the Institute of Applied Autonomy, uh, and you told me something interesting uh, about uh, Monsanto corn mm -hmm. that you found uh, crossed with an organic variation, and you, because Monsanto has copyright on their uh, corn, uh, you are not able or allowed to have that corn yourself, so you crossed it back and now you have open source. Close, can I pick okay. up the thread? Yeah. Um, Please explain. This is uh, an exhibit that uh, sort of lived in our storefront window for a while. Um, and basically the dilemma is, as a, as a museum interested in documenting the genetically modified world, um, We've had pretty good luck getting access to universities, people who do public research, but private corporations are very protective of, of their work. They consider that to be their intellectual property. Um, so if you're the largest seed maker in the world, Monsanto, uh, you sell to farmers and you sell in huge quantity. You sell primarily to industrial farmers, massive quantities of seed. Uh, and with each bag, there is a license agreement literally that says, by opening this bag, you agree to these terms. So if you've ever like opened some software, there's a similar agreement. Um, it works the same way. And, and the terms of it basically say that they own the seed, um, they, ref they, they refer to the seed as a technology, which is fantastic, and then they refer to the farmer as a steward. So you are the steward of their technology. Um, they, are, they own everything. They still own the seed that you've planted. You're just using it. Uh, you are responsible for any consequences of its use, but you're also required to kind of douse it in the herbicide that they've also patented. So you're, you're kind of subscribing to this company and having to purchase this line of products as you go. Uh, so for us to get specimens of that, just to document it for our collection, just a few seeds, uh, is virtually impossible financially and, and legally is perilous. Um, if we were to ask a farmer to give us, we would be in violation of the terms of that agreement and Monsanto is very aggressive, famously so, with their attorneys. Uh, so how to get around that? Well, in the US and in the EU now, uh, industrial corn, corn that's genetically engineered to be herbicide tolerant, uh, is all over the animal food supply. It's not the corn that we buy in the store and that we eat, although it might be in our corn chips or something like that, but the seed ends up in uh, animal feedstocks. 
Uh, it also ends up in pet food, uh, things that are labeled not for human consumption. So if you can go to your local pet store, or you know, the, the more commercial, the better, uh, look for bird seed that contains corn in it. Um, hopefully it's labeled not for human consumption. That's a good sign for the purposes of this experiment. Uh, plant that seed, grow it up, then get yourself some Roundup, which you can, I've seen it in stores here. Uh, you spray it with the Roundup, and the Roundup will kill any green plant, basically, uh, except for the ones that Monsanto genetically engineered to be Roundup resistant. So anything that lives at that point, these are specimens uh, of Monsanto Roundup ready corn, and you have not violated the terms of that agreement. You did not sign it, you did not open the bag of seed. Um, and it's the best fair use argument I can think of, so um, I would welcome their attorney's attention. That's a nice story. Um, uh, another thing that has to do with, with the Project Studio Lab, um, we had you a few years ago here during the picnic festival and um, invited an audience together with you to experience how it is to um, uh, sedate and kill animals for um, reasons of putting them in your collection. So we had uh, zebra fish sedated by clove oil. Mm. Uh, painless, uh, and um, the purpose of that was to um, engage an audience hands-on in um, something uh, that has to do with uh, making this kind of art or uh, something similar to biotechnology in order to see whether they um, take on another attitude towards um, a debate about those technologies. As the three of you um, yeah, reflect a lot about uh, uh, those uh, uh, subjects. Do you think that method uh, is an interesting method and will lead to another uh, opinion, public opinion in the societal debate about uh, life sciences? I mean, we are so separated from death and from, well, not from killing specifically. We're, we're very mediated from killing. It's sort of like either you're a, you're a hunter or a fisherman, like there are sort of roles culturally we have where like you're, you do some killing. Um, but on the whole, we're really absent from it, especially like with vertebrates, you know, we'll squash bugs and stuff. But with, particularly within genetic engineering, within biology, killing is like, it's just a ubiquitous everyday part of the process. You make hundreds of things and then you kill them and you move on and it's just, so somebody who works in a lab gets really used to it. Um, and to the extent that we are all participants in that stuff, we are all in some way on the receiving end of that research or if it's farm work, uh, whatever it is, um, making that experiential just for a minute, just like kill one fish, not for food, and that's kind of the important part of what we were doing there. It was like, you, you, you don't stand to benefit from this experience other than having the experience of, of killing something. Um, and it still makes me queasy, uh, but I, it, it's an experience I think is good to invite others to. What was interesting about that workshop was we had a fairly packed room uh, when we introduced the concept, and there was, I think, four people who stayed who were all women in their 20s. I wouldn't have predicted it. <laughs> we didn't uh, um, further research. Uh, yeah, no, um, it was a small sample Why size, it was but, those women in that 20s. But, uh, yeah, yeah, you can't anticipate. No, but uh, uh, that uh, um, workshop was about killing, but uh, there's also uh, um, other workshops, like the ones done at the honors class at uh, Rob Zweinenberg here in the front has done uh, uh, so often with uh, um, making transgenic bacteria fluorescent, something that is done uh, uh, in um, high schools in the United mm -hmm. States often, as you can buy those kits to do so online. Uh, do you think that approach also helps trying to change um, a public opinion about life sciences, courts and mm. ties? Well. I think it's good when young people start doing these experiments and uh, have these questions and talk about it and then decide whether they want to join in or refuse it. I killed thousands of 
small fishes myself, I'm afraid. But I, I know some biologists who chose to be behavioral ecologists because they didn't like killing animals. So mm. Some of them has escaped to, they, they start as zoologists and then they escape to animal behavior or they become botanists. <laughs> yeah. We did a similar experiment uh, um, with Adam Zaretsky at the Lowlands Festival last weekend where the audience was invited to um, inject a zebrafish embryo with a, um, David, correct me if I'm wrong, an agrobacterium that contains, uh, sorry? Cyanobacteria that contains uh, uh, chloroplast uh, in order to, no, okay. Oh, we have a cyanobacteria and spirulina in the form of algae. Okay, but uh, uh, there was, also there, there were very, very few rejections, um, but there were. Um, I think, yeah, there were some, but usually people, uh, I think it's not bold enough in a way, because uh, uh, it's, it would become very interesting once people started to, uh, killing little piglets before they eat a hamburger. Then it would be really confronting. I think there's a big difference between uh, killing small, tiny an animals under, under a microscope or cute animals that you uh, rather have as pets. Mm -hmm. And there's this slider in between that uh, yeah, people are willing to cross. And some people already in the beginning say, no, fundamentally I don't do it. But there are only very few, and I think it's interesting how, how you can see the slider go. Because killing a kitten, throwing a kitten out of the window, I think no one would do it. And so somewhere in between, you stop. And uh, why? I don't know. It's a genetic relatedness. Probably. You recognize something. Yeah. You, you won't recognize spiders so, so, so much in, yeah. in a fish or a yeah, spider. Or, or, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, start, it starts when animals have hair. Mm. Yeah. Then it becomes difficult. Yeah, and when they look like babies, it becomes impossible. Mm. Yeah. Is there uh, any uh, questions or comments from the audience? Hello. Um, I'm just curious if there's any examples where genetic or post-natural animals kind of fled the laboratory and take over real nature, maybe replace the sewer rats with white rats or something? Uh, can you imagine with the mosquitoes that can happen pretty fast? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I can give you a, a, the example of the mosquito is an interesting one. It, it right now is the first genetically engineered animal uh, that is intended to leave the lab. Uh, usually with this stuff, they spend a lot of infrastructure and money on containment uh, so that it doesn't, doesn't get out. We don't have unknown effects. Um, but those are being specifically designed to alter the ecology to alter the landscape of, of the specific mosquitoes that carry dengue fever or malaria, respectively. Um, and there has been examples that they can point to in the past where they would say that was successful. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 50s, there was the, a screw worm blight uh, in the US, which is, this is gross, but it's a maggot, it's a, well, maggot's a baby fly. So the fly infects the rotting skin of an infected cow and then it keeps eating, the babies keep eating the healthy flesh. So you have flesh-eating maggots all over southern North America. This sounds horrible. Um, but there, there was this major initiative to release into the wild uh, male screw worms that had been irradiated so that they could not reproduce. Um, and they would breed with the female screw worms that are for whatever reason, monogamous, uh, and each generation they would kind of, the population would kind of diminish down. So that's the model they're following. They would point to that as a, as a success. Uh, it actually is the opposite of your question, though. So your question is really about the ones that get out and, and propagate wildly. Um, yeah, I know about a story, uh, uh, scientists in Japan uh, managed to um, alter uh, malaria mosquito that it would not spread the disease anymore but it would start spreading uh, a vaccine so uh, now we have a big problem with being stinged by uh, mosquitoes and people get malaria and they have to be vaccinated but what if we could alter 
the mosquitoes that they are not spreading the disease, but they are vaccinating people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really that's really a difficult question. Should you get them out there in the open? There are big opportunities because malaria is big, uh, huge problem, and uh, yeah, why not do it? Um, of course, there will be religious people who say, I don't want to be vaccinated, but you're lying in your, in your bed, in your home, and the bug stings you, and yeah, you have your vaccination all set. Uh, or maybe if, if it stinks 500 times, you get an overdose. All these things have to be uh, considered. But yeah, still, I think this is an example of what could be a great opportunity. Well, um, I was just thinking something unethical, that the, the, the increase of the world's yeah, population uh, uh, will be enormous when malaria disappears. You're not supposed right. to think about that, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. Uh, maybe new disasters will pop up once uh, malaria has disappeared. Oh, so yeah. now many b uh, babies die before they have their first birthday, but maybe that's less cruel than what's going to come if all these uh, children survive. Yeah. Up yeah, to we should never be n naive about whether we can control the situation entirely, I think. Because there will always be some mm -hmm. genetic surprise mm -hmm. uh, or evolutionary surprise uh, po popping up. Mm -hmm. But that's life. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, I guess most people will say that if you show in your museum those GM uh, products and are busy with it, that in one way or another, it makes it more legitimate to being with doing those things. But do you report uh, from your visitors also that they have more a pro attitude towards GM, or do you don't you report at all uh, the, the reactions of your visitors? And, and in fact, I would also ask the other speakers, the other panel members, in how far they have. Uh, they know something about the reactions of the, of the audience. Is it, is it indeed the case that they become more pro, or does it make the, the debate more broader? So not, yeah, so let's say there's more, more, more shades of opinion and so on. I, I certainly would hope that the debate becomes more nuanced. We are very interested in what happens when people come to the museum. People will come in with uh, expecting a certain position, and they'll then leave thinking that they experienced the opposite, and that's happened in both directions, um, which just, to me, points to the complexities of the issues. Um, but as the, the first question about um, legitimization, uh, I think there's, there's nothing the, the industry would love more than to be able to conduct whatever research they want, whatever products they want to make uh, in secrecy without anybody looking and paying attention to it. So I think in the act of simply pointing at something is a critical act um, in, in an environment where it would otherwise just be invisible. Yeah, I think it's very important that we move from the should we do this question to the how do we do this question. And I think your project is very helpful in that. Um, and, and what you mentioned about corporations, I, I also want, like to mention that's one big elephant in the room because we tend to think, if we have this, hear this discussion, that people are the dom dominant species right now on Earth, but perhaps that's not the case. Corporations are a dominant species on Earth, and they are a species of a different kind that is not dependent on uh, fresh air or the biosphere at all, or in a different way. And uh, there's a risk there, because these companies like Monsanto, what they're doing with grains, that's really not helpful for human humanity, I think. And so we should gain some control there as people. And that works best if uh, everyone out there is, uh, has, has the right awareness of what's going on. And again, I think this project that we now will go and look up at stairs is very helpful in that regard. Thank you, Thijs Goldsmith. Thank you, Kurt van Mensvoort. And of course, thank you, Richard Pell, for this uh, uh, talk and presentation. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mason Judai for making the magnificent installation we're going to look at. One last brief question to Kurt and Thijs. Okay. Do you miss any species? Because you have seen the thing upstairs. Not really. The, the post-natural biologist. No, <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I, I have one, actually. 
the banana. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. such an example. <laughs> People in the supermarket think this is a natural thing, but if you look at a wild banana, it's full of seeds. Mm. It's unedible. It's it's mm. small. It's it's just not convenient. And this is such a great design, you know, <laughs> <laughs> already for a very long time. So yeah, it should be in there. I don't know if it's European, but yeah. It but that be. holds for thousands of fruits. Of course. Yeah. 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 All, I think most fruits we eat, and also, uh, well, the, the the last original cow died in Poland in the 17th century. So all the cattle we have is domesticated and made by people, mm. and we don't realize it when on a Sunday we see these cows in the field and we think, oh, it's nature, mm. but already it's I, I remember something else. In a, in a lecture that you mentioned them, actors. Yes, these cows. Yeah. Huh? They, 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 out they create the illusion of okay. uh, pristine nature. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Please feel free to go up and have a look at uh, the beautiful installation Post Natural Organisms of the Euro European Union. The modern tulip has its wild origins somewhere in the mountains of Central Asia, where it has literally hundreds of hardier, though less flamboyant, cousins. Celebrated throughout the Ottoman Empire, it wasn't until the 16th century that the tulip found its way to the Netherlands, where the flower found its most enthusiastic reception. Dutch tulip growers managed to breed the tulip into a rainbow of colors and patterns, even without any understanding of modern genetics. The rarest, most expensive tulip had delicate swirls of thin white stripes running through the petals. These so-called broken tulips would appear in a garden seemingly without warning and could only be propagated through a primitive and unreliable form of plant cloning.